This video will reference the Fire and Blood book to show exactly what the TV series chose to focus on and how they chose to adapt it, and whether they decide to include the Old Town conspiracy that theorizes the Maesters are secretly responsible for the demise of both the Dragons and House Targaryen. In Episode 1 of House of the Dragon, the show chooses to adapt the Great Council of 101 AC, where Viserys is named heir over Rhaenys and Laenor Targaryen. Then we follow the reign of King Viserys I, after the death of King Jaehaerys in 103 with his wife, Emma, and daughter Rhaenyra. Next, the show adapts the tawny at Maidenpool to commemorate King Viserys I's ascension in 104 AC, which is changed to King's Landing, because House Moonton of Maidenpool wasn't introduced in Game of Thrones. Next, we see the death of Queen Emma in 105, which causes Viserys to name Princess Rhaenyra as his heir in place of Daemon Targaryen. Now, all the characters in the book have been aged up. For example, in the books, Emma marries Viserys when she was just 11 and gives birth to Rhaenyra at 15. These are very welcome changes from the book. And now let's begin. All the Seven Kingdoms wept for brave Balon and none more so than King Jaehaerys. This time, when he lit his son's funeral pyre, he did not even have the comfort of his beloved wife beside him. The old king had never been so alone, and now again his grace faced a nettlesome dilemma. For once more, the succession was in doubt, with both of the heirs apparent dead and burned. There was no longer a clear successor to the Iron Throne. But that was not to say there was any lack of claimants. Balon had sired three sons by his sister Alyssa. Two, Viserys and Daemon, still lived. Had Balon ever taken the Iron Throne, Viserys would have followed him without question. But the Crown Prince's tragic death at the age of 4 and 40 muddied the succession. The claims of Princess Rhaenys, the rightful heir, and her daughter, Lena Valerion, were put forward once again. And even if they were to be passed over on account of their sex, Rhaenys' son, Lenor, faced no such impediment. Lenor Valerion was male and could claim descent from Jaehaerys' elder son, whilst Balon's boys were descended from the younger. Reports had reached the court that Corlys, Valerion, was massing ships and men on Driftmark to defend the rights of his son, Lenor. Whilst Daemon Targaryen, a hot-tempered and quarrelsome young man of 20, had gathered his own band of sworn swords in support of his brother, Viserys. A violent struggle for succession was likely no matter who the old king named to succeed him. No doubt that was why his grace seized eagerly on the solution offered by Archmaester Vagon. King Jaehaerys announced his intent to convene a great council to discuss, debate, and ultimately decide the matter of succession. All the great and lesser lords of Westeros would be invited to attend, together with maesters from the citadel of Old Town, and scepters and septons to speak for the faith. Let the climates make their cases before the assembled lords, his grace decreed. He would abide by the council's decision, whomever they might choose. Lords came from every corner of the realm, from the Dornish marches to the shadow of the wall, from the Three Sisters to the Iron Islands. The even star of Tarth was there, and the Lord of the Lonely Light. From Winterfell came Lord Ellard Stark, from Riverrun, Lord Grover Tully, from the Vale, Yobert Royce, regent and protector for young Jean Arryn, Lady of the Eyrie. Even the Dornishmen were represented. The Prince of Dawn sent his daughter and 20 Dornish knights to Harrenhal as observers. The High Septon came from Old Town to bless the assembly. Merchants and tradesmen descended upon Harrenhal by the hundreds. Hedge knights and free riders came in hopes of finding work for their swords. Cut purses came seeking after coin. Old women and young girls came seeking after husbands. Thieves and whores, washerwomen and camp followers, singers and mummers. They came from east and west and north and south. A city of tents sprang up outside the walls of Harrenhal and along the lake shore for leagues in each direction. For a time, Harrenhal was the fourth city in the realm. Only Old Town, King's Landing and Lannisport were larger. No fewer than 14 claims were duly examined and considered by the lords assembled. The Great Council deliberated for 13 days the tenuous claims of nine lesser competitors were considered and discarded. One such, a hedge knight who put himself forward as a natural son of King Jaehaerys himself, was seized and imprisoned when the king exposed him as a liar. 
Archmaester Vagon was ruled out on account of his vows and Princess Rhaenys and her daughter on account of their sex, leaving the two claimants with the most support, Viserys Targaryen, eldest son of Prince Balon, who was the second son, and Princess Alyssa, and Laenor Valyrian, the son of Princess Rhaenys and grandson of Prince Aemon. Viserys was the old king's grandson, Laenor his great-grandson. The principle of primogenitor favoured Laenor, the principle of proximity Viserys. Viserys had also been the last Targaryen to ride Beleriand, though after the death of the Black Dread in 94 AC, he never mounted another dragon, whereas the boy Lenore had yet to take his first flight upon his young dragon, a splendid grey and white beast he named Sea Smoke. But Viserys' claim derived from his father, Lenore's from his mother, and most lords felt that the male line must take precedence over the female. Moreover, Viserys was a man of 24, Lenor a boy of 7. For all these reasons, Lenor's claim was generally regarded as the weaker. But the boy's mother and father were such powerful and influential figures that it could not be dismissed entirely. This excerpt showcases the bias of the Grand Maesters against Rainies who can produce dragon riding children and eggs. Unsurprisingly, the sea snake was bitterly disappointed when Prince Aemon died and King Jaehaerys bypassed Aemon's daughter, Rhaenys, in favour of his brother, Balon, the Spring Prince. But now, it seems the wheel had turned again and the wrong could be righted. Thus did Lord Corlys and his wife, the Princess Rhaenys, arrive at Harrenhal in high state, using the wealth and influence of House Valyrian to persuade the lords assembled that their son, Laenor, should be recognised as heir to the Iron Throne. In these efforts, they were joined by the Lord of Storm's End, Boromund Baratheon, great uncle to Rhaenys and great great uncle to the boy Lenore, by Lord Stark of Winterfell, Lord Manderley of White Harbour, Lord Dustin of Barrowtown, Lord Blackwood of Raventree, Lord Bar Aemon of Sharppoint, Lord Keltigar of Claw Isle, and others. They were nowhere near enough, though Lord and Lady Valyrian were elegant and open-handed in their efforts on behalf of their son. The decision of the Great Council was never truly in doubt. By a lopsided margin, the Lords assembled chose Viserys Targaryen as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Though the maesters who tailored the votes never revealed the actual numbers. It was said afterward that the vote had been more than 20 to 1. King Jaehaerys had not attended the council, but when word of the verdict reached him, his grace thanked the lords for their service and gratefully conferred the style Prince of Dragonstone upon his grandson Viserys. Storm's End and Driftmark accepted the decision, if grudgingly. The vote had been so overwhelming that even Lenore's father and mother saw that they could not hope to prevail. In the eyes of many, the Great Council of 101 AC thereby established an iron precedent on matters of succession. Regardless of seniority, the Iron Throne of Westeros could not pass to a woman, nor through a woman to her male descendants. Of the last years in the reign of King Jaehaerys, little and less need be said. Prince Balon had served his father as Hand of the King as well as Prince of Dragonstone. But after his death, his grace elected to divide these honours. As his new hand, he called upon Sir Otto Hightower, younger brother to Lord Hightower of Oldtown. Sir Otto brought his wife and children to court with him, and served King Jaehaerys faithfully for the years remaining to him. As the old king's strength and wits began to fail, he was oft confided to his bed. Sir Otto's precocious 15-year-old daughter, Alicent, became his constant companion, fetching his grace his meals, reading to him, helping him to bathe and dress himself. The old king sometimes mistook her for one of his daughters, calling her by their names near the end. He grew certain she was his daughter, Sarah, returned to him from beyond the narrow sea. In the year 103 AC, King Jaehaerys I Targaryen died in his bed as Lady Alicent was reading to him from Septon Bath's Unnatural History. His grace was nine and sixty years of age, and had reigned over the Seven Kingdoms since coming to the Iron Throne at the age of 14. His remains were burnt in the Dragon Pit, his ashes interred with good Queen Alysanne's on Dragonstone. All of Westeros mourned, even in Dawn, where his writ had not extended. Men wept and women tore their garments. In accordance with his own wishes and the decision of the Great Council of 101, 
His grandson, Viserys, succeeded him, mounting the Iron Throne as King Viserys I Targaryen. At the time of his ascent, King Viserys was 26 years old. He had been married for a decade to a cousin, Lady Emma of House Arryn, herself a granddaughter of the old king, and good Queen Alysanne through her mother. The late Princess Daella died 82 AC. Lady Emma had suffered several miscarriages and the death of one son in the cradle over the course of her marriage. Some maesters felt she had been married and bedded too young. But she had also given birth to a healthy daughter, Rhaenyra, born 97 AC. The new king and his queen both doted on the girl, their only living child. Many consider the reign of King Viserys I to represent the apex of Targaryen power in Westeros. Beyond a doubt, there were more lords and princes claiming the blood of the dragon than any period before or since. Though the Targaryens had continued their traditional practice of marrying brother to sister, uncle to niece, and cousin to cousin wherever possible, there had also been important matches outside the royal family, the fruit of which would play important roles in the war to come. There were more dragons than ever before as well, and several of the she-dragons were regularly producing clutches of eggs. Not all of these eggs hatched, but many did, and it became customary for the fathers and mothers of newborn princelings to place a dragon's egg in their cradles. Following a tradition that Princess Reyna had begun many years before, it seems though both Princess Rhaenys, Lenore's mum, and Princess Reyna, Aenys eldest, were both passed over from becoming queen because they were integral to the sudden rise of both dragons and dragon riders, which is why the maesters schemed to keep them from inheriting the Iron Throne, despite both being the rightful heir and able to produce dragon eggs. The children so blessed invariably bonded with the hatchlings to become dragon riders. Viserys I Targaryen had a generous, amenable nature and was well loved by his lords and small folk alike. The reign of the young king, as the commons called him upon his ascent, was peaceful and prosperous. His grace's open-handedness was legendary. The Red Keep became a place of song and splendor. King Viserys and Queen Emma hosted many a feast and tawny, and lavished gold, offices, and honors on their favorites. At the center of the merriment, cherished and adored by all, was their only surviving child, Princess Rhaenyra, whom the court singers dubbed the realm's delight. Though only six when her father came to the Iron Throne, Rhaenyra Targaryen was a precocious child, bright and bold and beautiful as only one of dragon's blood can be beautiful. At seven, she became a dragon rider, taking to the sky on the young dragon she named Cyrax, after a goddess of old Valyria. At eight, the princess was placed into service as a cupbearer, but for her own father, the king. At table, at tawny, and at court. King Viserys thereafter was seldom seen without his daughter by his side. Meanwhile, the tedium of rule was left largely to the king's small council and his hand. Sir Otto Hightower had continued in that office, serving the grandson as he had the grandsire, an able man all agreed, though many found him proud, brusque, and haughty. The longer he served, the more imperious Sir Otto became, it was said, and many great lords and princes came to resent his manner and envy him his access to the Iron Throne. The greatest of his rivals was Daemon Targaryen, the king's ambitious, impetuous, moody younger brother. As charming as he was hot-tempered, Prince Daemon had earned his knight's spurs at six and ten, and had been given dark sister by the old king himself in recognition of his prowess. Though he had wed the Lady of Runestone in 97 AC during the old king's reign, the marriage had not been a success. Prince Daemon found the Vale of Arryn boring. In the Vale, the men fuck sheep, he wrote. You cannot fault them. Their sheep are prettier than their women. And soon developed a mislike of his lady wife, whom he called my bronze b after the runic bronze armor worn by the lords of House Royce. Upon the ascension of his brother to the Iron Throne, the prince petitioned to have his marriage set aside. Viserys denied the request but did allow Daemon to return to court, where he sat on the small council, serving as master of coin from 103 to 104, and master of laws for half a year in 104. Governance bore this warrior prince, however. He did better when King Viserys made him commander of the city watch. Finding the watchman ill-armed and clad in oddments and rags, 
Daemon equipped each man with dirk, short sword, and cudgel, armored them in black ring mail with breastplates for the officers, and gave them long golden cloaks that they might wear with pride. Ever since, the men of the City Watch have been known as Gold Cloaks. Prince Daemon took eagerly to the work of the Gold Cloaks, and oft prowled the alleys of King's Landing with his men. That he made the city more orderly, no man could doubt, but his discipline was a brutal one. He delighted in cutting off the hands of pickpockets, gelding rapists and slitting the noses of thieves, and slew three men in street balls during his first year as commander. Before long, the prince was well known in all the low places of King's Landing. He became a familiar sight in wine sinks, where he drank for free, and gambling pits, where he always left with more coin than when he entered. Though he sampled countless whores in the city's brothels and was said to have an especial fondness for deflowering maidens, a certain Lycine dancing girl soon became his favourite. Mycaria was the name she went by, though her rivals and enemies called her Misery, the White Worm. As King Viserys had no living son, Daemon regarded himself as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and coveted the title Prince of Dragonstone, which his grace refused to grant him. But by the end of year 105 AC, he was known to his friends as the Prince of the City, and to the small folk as Lord Fleabottom. Though the king did not wish Daemon to succeed him, he remained fond of his younger brother and was quick to forgive his many offences. Princess Rhaenyra was also enamoured of her uncle, for Daemon was ever attentive to her. Whenever he crossed the narrow sea upon his dragon, he brought her some exotic gift on his return. The king had grown soft and plump over the years. Viserys never claimed another dragon after Beleriand's death, nor did he have much taste for the joust, the hunt, or sword play, whereas Prince Daemon excelled in these spheres, and seemed all that his brother was not. Lean and hard, a renowned warrior, dashing, daring, more than a little dangerous. On one point, Mushroom, Septon Eustace, Grand Maester Runketer, and all our other sources concur. Sir Otto Hightower, the King's Hand, took a great dislike to the King's brother. It was Sir Otto who convinced Viserys to remove Prince Daemon as Master of Coin. Then, as Master of Laws, actions the Hand soon came to regret. As Commander of the City Watch, with 2,000 men under his command, Daemon waxed more powerful than ever. On no account can Prince Daemon be allowed to ascend to the Iron Throne, the hand wrote his brother, Lord of Old Town. He would be a second Magor, or worse. It was Sir Otto's wish, then, that Princess Rhaenyra succeed her father. Better the realm's delight than Lord Fleabottom, he wrote. Nor was he alone in his opinion, yet his party faced a formidable hurdle. If the president set by the Great Council of 101 was followed, a male claimant must prevail over a female. In the absence of a true-born son, the king's brother would come before the king's daughter, as Balon had come before Rhaenys in 92 AC. As for the king's own views, all the chronicles agree that King Viserys hated dissension. Though far from blind to his brother's flaws, he cherished his memories of the free-spirited, adventurous boy that Daemon had been. His daughter was his life's great joy, he often said, but a brother is a brother. Time and time again, he strove to make peace between Prince Daemon and Sir Otto, but the enmity between the two men roiled endlessly. Beneath the false smiles they wore at court, when pressed upon the matter, King Viserys would only say that he was certain his queen would soon present him with a son. And in 105 AC, he announced to the court and small council that Queen Emma was once again with child. During that same fateful year, Sir Criston Cole was appointed to the King's Guard to fill the place created by the death of the legendary Sir Ryan Redwine. Born the son of a steward in service to Lord Dondarrion of Blackhaven, Sir Criston was a comely young knight of three and twenty years. He first came to the attention of the court when he won the melee held at Maidenpool in honour of King Viserys' ascension. In the final moments of the fight, Sir Criston knocked Dark Sister from Prince Daemon's hand with his Morning Star, to the delight of his grace and the fury of the prince. Afterward, he gave the seven-year-old Princess Rhaenyra the victory's laurel and begged for her favour to wear in the joust. 
In the list, he defeated Prince Daemon once again, and unhorsed both of the celebrated Cargyle twins, Sir Eric and Eric of the Kingsguard, before falling to Lord Lyman Malister. With his pale green eyes, coal black hair, and easy charm, Cole soon became a favourite of all the ladies at court, not the least amongst them Rhaenyra Targaryen herself. So smitten was she by the charms of the man she called My White Knight, that Rhaenyra begged her father to name Sir Criston her own personal shield and protector. His grace indulged her in this, as in so much else. Thereafter, Sir Criston always wore her favour in the lists, and became a fixture at her side during feasts and frolics. Not long after Sir Criston donned his white cloak, King Viserys invited Lionel Strong, Lord of Harrenhal, to join the small council as Master of Laws. A big man, burly and balding, Lord Strong enjoyed a formidable reputation as a battler. Those who did not know him, oft took him for a brute, mistaking his silences and slowness of speech for stupidity. This was far from the truth. Lord Lionel had studied at the Citadel as a youth, earning six links of his chain before deciding that a maester's life was not for him. He was literate and learnt, his knowledge of the laws of the Seven Kingdoms exhaustive. Thrice wed and thrice a widower, the Lord of Harrenhal brought two maiden daughters and two sons to court with him. The girls became handmaids to Princess Rhaenyra, whilst their elder brother, Sir Harwin Strong, called Breakbones, was made a captain in the Gold Cloaks. The younger boy, Larry's the Clubfoot, joined the King's Confessors. Thus did matters stand in King's Landing late in the year 105 AC, when Queen Emma was brought to bed in Magor's Holdfast and died whilst giving birth to the son that Viserys Targaryen had desired for so long. The boy, named Valon after the King's father, survived her only by a day, leaving King and court bereft, save perhaps for Prince Daemon who was observed in a brothel on the Street of Silk, making drunken japes with his highborn cronies about the heir for a day. When word of this got back to the king, legend says that it was the whore sitting in Damon's lap who informed on him, but evidence suggests it was actually one of his drinking companions, a captain in the gold cloaks eager for advancement, Viserys became livid. His grace had finally had a surfeit of his ungrateful brother and his ambitions. Once his mourning for his wife and son had run its course, the king moved swiftly to resolve the long-simmering issue of the succession. Disregarding the precedent set by King Jaehaerys in 92 and the Great Council in 101, Viserys declared his daughter, Rhaenyra, to be his rightful heir and named her Princess of Dragonstone. In a lavish ceremony at King's Landing, Hundreds of lords did obeyance to the realm's delight as she sat at her father's feet at the base of the Iron Throne, swearing to honour and defend her right of succession. Honestly, the show's done a fantastic job at recreating that Game of Thrones magic by just following the books as best they can with the added spectacle. We also think the change of having Viserys responsible for killing his wife was a great addition and explains his later alcoholism. Moreover, Christian Cole as a character has always been bit of an anomaly, so it'll be good to see what the show decides to do with him, and having Rhaenyra and Alicent be girlhood friends was a great idea. We believe Lionel Strong was bribed by Viserys' camp to help ensure the vote would suggest Viserys won the Great Council by such a large margin that no one would question it hereafter, and in return for doing this, Lionel Strong would be given a place on Viserys' small council years later in 105 AC as payment for skewering the results. Maybe Lionel also knows about the Old Town conspiracy and was either a part of it or just knew of its existence. So when he agreed to rig the results at Harrenhal for Viserys, he sought out the maesters to help him do it, which is why he was brought to the capital. Moreover, Preston Jacob's great video series Overanalyzing House of the Dragon Part 8 showcases that Otto was probably responsible for calling Daemon Lord Fleabottom and arranging for Viserys to hear about Daemon's heir for a day remark, whether it was actually spoken by Daemon or not. Anyway, this was a really great episode of House of the Dragon, and we can't wait to make more videos on the differences between the show and book. In the meantime, check out our playlist on every chapter of A Game of Thrones Explained and our entire A Feast for Dragons book Explained. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flight's A Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.